Hello, welcome to our session today. We're giving a deep dive into quantum computing using Amazon Bracket on AWS. I'm Richard Moulds, and I'm the general manager at Amazon Bracket. And I'm joined by Tyler Takashida, who's one of our solution architects focused on quantum computing. But I'm also thrilled that we're joined by Marco Pistoria from JP Morgan Chase. He's a distinguished engineer, and he leads the research effort there in quantum computing. Now, rather than dive in to how quantum computing actually works, that's a pretty detailed subject, today we're going to focus on the state of the industry itself and how you can get started and when you should get started on your own journey into quantum computing. To most people, quantum computing is a bit of an odd duck. It's definitely unfamiliar. And sometimes we think it lives in its own little world. Until recently, quantum computing was mostly confined to the realms of academics. But lately, it's become much more promising, prominent. I'm sure you've all heard mentions in the news of IPOs, new hardware coming online, and the constant chatter about when quantum computers will outperform classical computers. As you can see on this slide, the terminology, the language that we use in the industry can be very different. And to some, it can be extremely overwhelming. Quantum computing is so different that it's tempting to think about it in isolation, separate from other computing types, traditional, quantum compu traditional classical computing. It's easy to think about it as just something in the future, something at the edge of our, of our area of interest, somebody else's problem, but that would be a mistake. It's true that quantum computing is at a very early stage, and I'm not aware, even today, of a useful example of where a quantum computer can outperform a classical computer. But clearly, we think that day will come. We're focused on generating innovation in the space to make that happen as soon as we possibly can. It's evolving very quickly, but it's not magic. So what makes quantum computing different from regular computers? Fundamentally, we're harnessing the power of quantum mechanics at the atomic scale to perform computation. So think about a traditional computer really as just adding, subtracting, multiplying static bits, ones and zeros, stored in memory. But with quantum computing using quantum mechanics, we have two fundamental and key differences, two real benefits. The first is that we're not limited to ones and zeros. Quantum bits, or qubits as we call them, can be in a superposition, a word I'm sure some of you have heard before, but the qubit can be in a superposition of both one and zero at the same time. This means that a quantum qubit can represent or encode exponentially more information than a classical bit. That's an extremely powerful capability. Also, the second area where it's different is that unlike bits in memory, which are static in a, quantum, in a classical computer, uh, the bits in a quantum computer or the qubits, they're not static. They interfere with each other. They actually interact with each other often through a process we call entanglement, but there are other mechanisms. Uh, what this means is that not only can these qubits store and, and, and encode an incredible amount of data, they can actually compute using that incredible amount of data through this notion of interaction. So these qubits are almost alive, interacting together, rather than being processed serially in a static memory that we have in a regular computer. So why is this useful? We think this could be disruptive technology. Okay, so some problems, some well-known problems for decades, we, we, we know very well, and many of you in this audience will have, will have experienced on a day-to-day -day basis, get really hard really quickly as the number of variables, the number of combinations increases. Which means the cost of computation gets really expensive as well, or it just takes a long time. So to solve these problems perfectly on a classical computer, is literally intractable at the scale we'd like to tackle these types of problems. No matter how fast that classical computer ever becomes, if we had an infinitely powerful classical computer, we still couldn't necessarily solve these problems. So today we're forced to make assumptions and simplifications in these problems just to simply get a result. But of course, that result is compromised by those simplifications that we've taken. So in principle, a quantum computer can address some of these problems. We shouldn't think of it as being able to address all problems, but certain mathematical problems that scale really badly uh, can, in principle, be handled by a quantum computer, which makes this slide an extremely compelling proposition. Some problems that are intractable today may well be solvable 
by a quantum computer in the future. It can become part of our production compute armory as we tackle a variety of industry problems. So of course, this is slide is, is wonderfully amb ambiguous, lots of missing details. There's no numbers on this slide. So in terms of you know, exactly what the cost benefit is, exactly when this is going to happen, exactly which types of problems quantum computers can address, you know, we carefully leave those off this slide. You know, so what time frame does this become interesting? You know, how quickly can we track progress against solving some of these problems? And what are the risks that we never actually make it? Building a quantum computer is extremely difficult. We are fighting nature essentially at every step of the way, and there are still plenty of risks that this might never happen, and there's still plenty of discoveries that are required in order for us to bring this to fruition. So if we think about the types of problems that a quantum computer might be able to solve in the future, they apply to lots of different industries. So in principle, there's very broad applicability for this technology. The problems we think about tend to fall into three categories. Simulating natural systems. So for example, in, this, in, the, in industries such as energy, uh, materials development, chemical engineering, medicine. So we're trying to model how molecules work, how atoms interact, and how, and how reactions actually happen from a chemical perspective. Second area is optimizing systems where there are lots of choices to be made. So for example, logistics, networking, uh, transportation in cities, lots of choices we can make about how to optimize a system. We think quantum computers could help in that area. And then thirdly, improving decision making. Uh, for example, optimizing uh, the risk or the cost in financial transactions, and this is an area that, that Marco uh, will talk about in a moment or two. Any one of these areas alone would have clear impact to a large variety of industries and have the potential to change the way that we live and how we treat our planet. But of course, there's a long way to go. Um, some of these applications require millions of error-free qubits to operate. Today, we have tens, maybe a hundred qubits, but unfortunately, they give the wrong answer about every what for, for one in every 1,000 operations. So we have a lot of areas, errors, and we have a much lower scale than we need to address many of these problems. We need orders of magnitude of improvement in terms of the quantity of qubits and the quality of qubits in order to deliver uh, real value. So we still have a long way to go, which obviously that begs some interesting questions, which I'm sure you're already asking. You know, so what does this mean for me? You know, how far away in the future is this? You know, does it, is this something that can benefit me as an individual? Is this something that can benefit my organization? You know, how should I get involved? What sort of resources do I need to get involved? And how can I get some help? Really, that comes down to the role that you anticipate playing in this industry. It's a very diverse industry. And it's interesting to think about how we might each participate. Okay, so it feels like a community right now. We're still, as I said, at the research stage in this industry. So generally speaking, the players in the industry are still very open to collaboration. We're still at that, at that point where, you know, essentially a rising tide floats all boats. Um, lots of specialization. Um, generally speaking, expertise within each of these areas remains relatively compartmentalized. There's still plenty of collaboration, but there's not much overlap necessarily between these different communities within the industry. Hardware developers, obviously we tend to think about the hardware first because that's right now fundamentally the constraining factor in quantum computing. They're ultra focused on building more qubits, building better qubits, and just trying to make better machines. Tool developers are really focused on how can they abstract away the complexity of quantum computing. You know, how can they optimize quantum algorithms? How can they enable layers of visualization to bring it to a broader developer base? Quantum computing is tough, it's complicated, it's different. We need to expand the number of, of developers that can, that can work with it constructively. Application specialists are focused obviously on finding that business value, whether it's optimization, chemistry, physics, whatever it might be, and how to express problems in a way that a quantum computer can actually address the issue. That's a challenge in itself. Uh, lots of researchers, of course, really dealing with some of the leading edge aspects of this industry, things like error correction, compilation, uh, benchmarking different types of quantum computers. We have educators. Today, there is maybe a couple of thousand people on the planet that understand quantum computing. We need to get to tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people that can understand this technology uh, and can get the most value from it. 
course, a lot of governments are worrying about how they can stimulate innovation within their own country, how they can create quantum hubs, how they can try to bring together a community uh, within a particular country. And then, of course, enterprises and customers and corporations uh, that are trying to figure out really what they can do with it. Uh, they're trying to connect some of these dots together to see how quantum computing can play into their existing computational environment and how it can address some of the issues of their existing applications. So the role we try to play at AWS is to bring this community together. We fundamentally want to become a town square for quantum computing, removing the barriers to adoption and accelerating innovation. We really want to cut through the hype that exists in the industry and give our customers the opportunity to really see what's going on, really see what the current state of play is. So from the perspective of researchers, users, developers, the folks on the top tier of this diagram, we're really trying to solve three problems. We're trying to make it easy to access different types of quantum hardware. We think there's real value in testing the actual machines, seeing really what trajectory they are on uh, from a value proposition perspective and see how their performance is evolving over time. There's at least six different ways you can build a quantum computer and each different approach has different characteristics in terms of performance, whether it be latency or throughput or accuracy, whatever it might be, they are different. And being able to track those differences and understand which particular approaches uh, are moving more quickly or, or are gearing themselves to particular applications is a very important thing to come to understand. The other thing we're trying to deliver is a consistent experience. In many ways, we're trying to democratize access to quantum computing. We're trying to get to a place where any developer can have access to leading edge technology. Not to have to subscribe, you know, large long-term commitments, simple, on demand, no commitment, traditional cloud access to quantum computing hardware and quantum computing sim simulators. Delivering a set of familiar tools to enable customers and users to be able to switch between different types of hardware in as easily as possible. And we're trying to deliver an operational performance that is reliable and predictable. That's not easy. Quantum computers are still very early stage. Capacity is very limited. This is by no means an elastic resource, very different to the rest of AWS. Nonetheless, there's a lot we can do in terms of delivering a consistent operational experience. The other thing we're trying to really focus on is how to integrate quantum computing within the broad set of resources that exist within the AWS platform. Um, so we're thinking in particular, for example, around the integration between classical and quantum compute. Um, also the integration at the service level between the bracket service and other AWS services, for example, focusing on security or access control, notifications, collaboration, managing data sets, storage. It's very important that, as I said, really in the outset of this session, don't think of quantum computing as being an isolated experience. Think about it as being part of a broad set of services and a broad set of choices around compute. We bring a lot of benefits to the hardware providers as well. As I said, they're critical to the industry. You know, we provide a method for them to showcase te technology uh, to a larger audience, and we provide a mechanism essentially to enable them to not have to worry about delivering things like you know, customer support, for example. Uh, we want to enable them to focus on what they do best, which is building great hardware, to in innovate around how to make these systems more scalable, and have a higher level of quality. We want to provide a voice for them in the marketplace. We launched a quantum blog channel uh, earlier this year, uh, and we provide a mechanism for our hardware partners to communicate with customers through that channel. So from a hardware point of view, trying to give hardware providers the opportunity to focus on what they do best, as well as give them a mechanism of interacting with the market. So how do we do that? Um, Again, we're not jumping into, into all the details here. Tyler will go into more details about how to actually use the bracket service in a moment. But fundamentally, the bracket service is built around exploration. Okay, This is not a production technology yet. People are not running production workloads on quantum computers. It's all about exploring the potential of quantum computers and learning how we will use them in the future. So we start with a managed developer experience. Uh, Jupyter notebooks, tutorials, reference guides, lots of information to get you started. Most customers will start with simulators. So simulating quantum computers using classical tools, classical resources to run quantum algorithms on simulated quantum computers. It's very convenient. They're always available. 
you can debug algorithms uh, locally on your own uh, on your own laptop, or you can use managed simulators that are provided through the service. You know, we're really lucky right now at this era in quantum computing, where essentially everything can be simulated. You know, we're not yet in a regime where you can run experiments that are beyond the bounds of simulation. So that makes life right now extremely convenient. Of course, in the future, as quantum computers become more powerful, we'll enter a regime where it's no longer possible to simulate their operations, uh, and customers will have to jump straight to the hardware. But right now, it's great. We can simulate quantum algorithms, uh, and, and a lot of customers start there. Then, of course, they move on to testing those algorithms on real hardware. Uh, today on Bracket, we offer access to three uh, quantum computers, uh, quantum annealer uh, by D-Wave, uh, an ion trap-based, circuit-based quantum computer uh, from ION-Q, and, and a quantum computer based on superconducting qubits uh, built by Rigetti. So throughout the whole process, you can track the evolution of your experiments, you can manage the results and, uh, and collaborate with others uh, using, um, uh, using the capabilities of Bracket as well. But there's one particular aspect of the Bracket service that I'd like to highlight now, and it really goes back to the point I made earlier about the interaction and integration between classical and quantum compute resources within AWS. So recently we launched a feature uh, to enable just that, the execution of hybrid classical quantum algorithms. We call the feature bracket hybrid jobs. At a high level, quantum and classical systems, you know, they'll always work in tandem. We shouldn't think about quantum computers as, as, as replacing classical computers in any way. Quantum computers are specialist devices for performing specific mathematical operations. So they'll always essentially be coprocessors to classical systems. Even when we get to the stage of having high-performance uh, error-free systems, they will still essentially operate uh, as coprocessors in the same way that a GPU might operate as a coprocessor to a CPU in a machine learning context today. But in the near term, the concept of a hybrid algorithm has a very specific meaning. In fact, it's been proposed as an entire era of quantum computing itself, as a near-term era that may run for the next, who knows, four or five years or so. And it's an era where we have to essentially live with what we have. You know, we have these relatively error-prone, these noisy quantum computers that exist today. We think today about hybrid algorithms as a way to try to overcome the limitations of today's hardware. So in theory, we can train quantum algorithms to minimize the impact of the noise that we experience in today's quantum hardware. So we can use an iterative approach where quantum computers and classical computers, again, act as coprocessors. So typically, a quantum algorithm is expressed as a circuit, essentially an analog to a traditional set of logical gates that you might think about when building an electronic circuit, for example. So a quantum circuit represented in a quantum algorithm is often combined with parameters that define the configuration of each qubit and the operations that we want to perform on those qubits using those gates. Sounds really complicated, but this diagram sort of shows how it works in practice. So we have a quantum algorithm, we define the circuit, we run the circuit on a quantum computer, and we get the results back. We can then use existing classical machine learning techniques to optimize the parameters that we should apply to the circuit for the next iteration. We provide those parameters back to the quantum computer, we rerun the circuit with the new parameters, get new results, go back to the optimization process, and go around this cycle iteratively, potentially 10,000 times, to really tune the parameters to best deal with the noise that is available and the error, the error characteristics of the, of the target hardware device that we're focused on. Okay, so that sounds complicated. Um, let's now switch. I'm gonna ask Tyler to explain how that works in practice. Well, thank you, Richard. So as Richard told you, through the Amazon Bracket service, you're able to access a number of devices, and this includes managed simulators as well as QPUs. And to help organize the way that you interact with these devices, we've come up with the concept of shots, tasks, and now jobs. So a shot is a collection of operations that you send to a quantum computer, and this can take the form of a quantum circuit or even an annealing schedule. Um, but because quantum computers are inherently probabilistic, 
you oftentimes want to repeat this set of operations several times. And that brings us to a quantum task. Now, a quantum task is just a collection of tens to even tens of thousands of shots. And then after that, as Richard mentioned, we are also interested in situations where quantum computers and classical computers work together in a hybrid fashion. Um, the example that's very common today are hybrid algorithms like VQE or QAOA, where the classical computer will update parameters and the quantum computer will execute a number of tasks. And this brings us to the concept of jobs. So the jo a hybrid job is a collection of quantum tasks. So now you see that there's a hierarchy here with the service where we have a job, which is a collection of tasks, a task, which is a collection of shots, and the service that, or the new feature that we've introduced in the service, hybrid jobs, is a way to organize or orchestrate the interplay between classical and quantum computers while managing all the tasks and shots that come along with it. So with Amazon Bracket, before the introduction of hybrid jobs, you have the ability to submit a quantum task and run that task either on one of the three managed simulators or some of the QPUs the service provides access to. Now the results were then sent to S3, and you also have the ability to track your task either through the Amazon Bracket Management Console or Amazon CloudWatch. What Hybrid Jobs introduces is a job instance that you can launch through the Bracket service, which manages your hybrid algorithm. Uh, there's a fair bit of customization here. Uh, I'll get into this in just a little bit, but you can provide custom job monitoring, or you can customize the container that runs on this instance. Through the service, we provide access to three containers, uh, but of course you can bring your own and use another service, Amazon ECR, to house that container. In addition to that, when you use the hybrid jobs feature, um, your jobs and the task related to that job have priority access to the quantum processors. Now, when it comes to submitting a, a job, we wanted to make it fairly straightforward and simple, very similar to how it is that you submit a task today. And so here on this slide, I have on the top uh, the command to submit a quantum task, and on the bottom, a job. And I'd like to walk you through it. So at the top, what we need to submit a quantum task is to first define the circuit or the set of commands that we'll send away uh, to the QPU or the simulator. And then we need to define the device. And in this case, I'm using the state vector simulator or SV1. And after that, really, to return your results, you just, it just requires one line. You see here that we're submitting a Bell circuit. Uh, we have to pro provide information about the S3 folder where the results will be stored, and then the number of shots for this task. When we move down to hybrid jobs, you can see that it's also just one line. Uh, there's a bit more input here, and I'll walk you through it, but it's, it's fairly straightforward. Again, we have to define our device. Uh, we select our Python script, or where our algorithm is, we select one of several images, and then we can provide input data like hyperparameters or, or some other data that's necessary uh, for your algorithm. And then you can launch your job. Again, very much like tracking a task, we've updated the management console uh, to have a jobs tab. So you, you see here at the top left, you have several tabs. Uh, originally, we had the device tab, the notebook tab, and the task tab. And now in orange here, we have the Jobs tab. Uh, very much like the Task tab, when you click on it, you'll see a list of your current jobs, uh, either the ones you've run in the past and have completed, uh, canceled, or currently running and queued. There's some basic information here, for example, the create time, uh, the device it's using, again, status as I mentioned, and also a link with the name of your, your job. And if you click on this, you can get much more information about the status uh, of your job and, and other important things. For example, uh, a link to S3. If you remember, a job is, has a, a large number of tasks associated with it, and it's very important that you, you have some structure around the output so you can analyze your results later. So with the hybrid jobs feature, we provide a structured set of folders within your S3 storage, or your S3 bucket, uh, which makes it easy to analyze your results at the end. On top of that, uh, some other things I'd like to highlight on this page here is uh, information about the event times, when it is your job was created, uh, when it started, and when it ended. And then, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there's custom monitoring capabilities. 
So here, if you were to click this monitor tab, if you had set your job up for uh, to monitor a particular metric as it's completing, uh, you can plot this or, or view this in near real time through the Amazon Bracket Management Console. Here's a small example. Uh, what I have plotted here on the left is a loss function with respect to the number of iterations. And you can see as we start to iterate, we see the loss function start to decrease and then eventually uh, converge a bit. Again, this is entirely customizable. Uh, you can monitor your progress and this lets you intervene if necessary or watch the behavior of your algorithms as they progress with respect to time. Now, this is very important, especially when you're developing new algorithms or trying to understand how this changes as you move from simulator or to different devices. And you can also access these logs from your container as well as CloudWatch. Now, I'd like to make a note here that, or point out again, that Amazon Bracket is just one of over uh, 175 fully featured cloud services. And this is really important because Amazon Bracket and our new feature hybrid jobs is just another step in our response to customers who want to use Amazon Bracket to access quantum resources as well as leverage other cloud services. And I'd like to provide you with a few examples of this. And here's an example of creating a custom API to access both quantum and HPC resources. So here in this, this architecture, you can see that we've paired Amazon Cognito and API Gateway to build a custom API. And this way, users can securely access both Amazon Bracket for quantum compute and other uh, AWS classical compute resources and services. Another example would be event-driven applications, where Amazon Bracket uh, is connected to Amazon EventBridge. And even today, changes, within, changes in the status of your task and your job can trigger events, which then lead to changes in storage, analytics, uh, databases, or even machine learning, and as mentioned before, classical compute. And so we see a lot of interest from our customers in, in building out uh, more complex and advanced architectures that are able to solve problems today, but are also flexible enough to account for changes in quantum technology and advances tomorrow. And with that, I'll hand it over to Richard again. Thanks, Tyler. Um, so what you've heard is that there's a tremendous opportunity to, to explore quantum computing uh, in AWS and specifically using the Amazon Bracket service in a variety of different ways, either simple experiments uh, ranging right through to using the new uh, hybrid jobs feature to explore how we can combine classical and quantum computers uh, to overcome the, um, the, the errors and the noise situation that exists in current compute, quantum computing hardware. And even how we can think more broadly about aligning uh, the experience of Amazon Bracket with the various other services that, that exist within AWS to really enhance and extend that capability. But before we get too far into really thinking big picture, you know, I think we should really now focus it down and, and hear how um, customers are actually using the service today. You know, what really they're thinking about in terms of how they plan their investment into quantum computing, how they try to assess the opportunities that are potentially in front of them, and really how they just can get started and make some progress. So I'm thrilled that Marco Pistoria from JP Morgan Chase is here. Um, he's going to give us some insight into how he thinks about quantum computing within you know, a large financial services company. Uh, as I mentioned in the introduction, uh, Marco is a distinguished engineer uh, and the head of research and quantum computing at JP Morgan Chase. Over to you, Marco. Thank you, Richard. I'm so excited to be here uh, and to give you an overview of what we are doing in the area of quantum computing at JP Morgan Chase. So I guess the first question that everybody wants to know the answer to is why is a bank working in quantum computing? Because I think uh, when quantum computing was first uh, even introduced as a, at a scientific level, everybody thought that it would be something useful for like chemistry or physics. So why is it something that uh, financial institutions are investing their efforts into? And the reason is actually quite surprising. So you can see here from this uh, diagram, which is taken from a um, report made by McKinsey and Company, you can see that finance is actually uh, projected to be the first industry sector 
to benefit from quantum computing, not only in the long and in the medium term, but even in the short term, even in the near term. So why is that? Uh, I think the reason is that in finance, we have uh, uh, so many use cases that can benefit from quantum computing. Pretty much every single problem that we face in, uh, in the financial industry uh, has some components with high complexity. And among these problems, we have portfolio optimization, der derivative pricing, uh, risk analysis, and uh, a lot of problems in the realm of uh, machine learning. Um, so um, we expect to see uh, finance benefiting from quantum advantage, which is the moment in which quantum uh, computers will be able to surpass uh, classical computers uh, and do better in terms of uh, performance and accuracy. So um, if we look at uh, a kind of the history of quantum computing so far, uh, in, the last, uh, in the past century, we started with quantum science. So uh, scientists worked uh, at the level of uh, theory uh, and uh, understanding how to build quantum computers from, from the foundations. Um, let me skip the middle, the middle column here. Let me go to quantum advantage. As I said, it's like the moment in which uh, quantum computers will be able to be used in production. We haven't reached that moment yet. So what are we doing now? We have to take advantage of this precious waiting time to become quantum ready. Uh, and that's why we have this quantum readiness concept here, uh, which means that we need to build um, uh, portfolios of algorithms and applications that can be used uh, for uh, production, that can be used in production in the future when quantum advantage becomes uh, a reality. We can also use this time to remain on top of the quantum hardware ecosystem because it's crucial for us to have access to multiple computers uh, and experiment with different hardware. And uh, uh, we, we have also seen that a lot of our efforts have been at the scientific level, so building new algorithms, testing them. But it's also important to transition these scientific efforts into business. So it cannot remain just at the scientific level. We have to start thinking about how we will use our uh, algorithmic assets in the future. And when I say we, I mean like the financial industry, but in reality, this applies to uh, many industry sectors. So what I just mentioned, algorithms and applications, hardware, and so on. And these are things that uh, any company working on quantum computing um, is probably looking into at this point. Um, so um, let's now focus a little bit more into the financial use cases. Uh, you can see from this table that we have identified uh, some mathematical problems like linear systems, linear systems of equations. Um, why is this important? Well, you can see at the very uh, right that these uh, linear systems can be applied to portfolio optimization. In other words, a portfolio optimization problem can be cast into a system of linear equations. And so um, the HHL quantum algorithm, for example, can be used uh, to uh, solve that portfolio optimization. Um, linear systems of equations have... Uh, um, the best classical complexity is linear, um, and uh, um, with uh, HHL, we can have a uh, uh, um, quantum uh, execution time that is polylogarithmic in N, where N is the number of uh, assets uh, of the portfolio. So the speed up is exponential. There are some considerations that have to be taken into account. For example, the matrix uh, of these um, uh, linear system of equations have to be well conditioned and sparse. Uh, and this applies to both the uh, classical and the quantum space. Uh, we have already actually um, uh, devised an extension of HHL, JP Morgan Chase, um, that uh, um, uh, is capable of being executed on uh, uh, near term quantum computers for small portfolios. You can see the citation at the bottom. Uh, we call this extension NISC HHL. Um, other approaches, other mathematical problems, there is, for example, combinatorial optimization over N elements. 
uh, here the best classical uh, complexity is exponential. Uh, there are two algorithms here that uh, can be considered. One is a variational algorithm, QAOA, which stands for uh, Quantum Approximation Optimization Algorithm. Um, this is actually uh, attractive, even though the quantum time is heuristic and the speed up is unproven. Uh, the reason why it's attractive is because um, the circuits are shallow, uh, or at least shallower than what you would get with other algorithms. And so for this reason, this algorithm lends itself to um, near-term quantum devices. Uh, we again um, experimented uh, portfolio optimization using uh, QAOA. You can see um, that uh, we have a paper in quantum, the quantum journal in 2021, and uh, we contributed uh, our solution also to the open source uh, project Qiskit. Uh, there is another uh, approach which is based on Grover search. Um, here, the uh, speed up is more modest uh, than uh, what we saw, for example, for uh, HHL. The speed up is quadratic, but still interesting because it's measurable. Um, and so um, there are some uh, problems that need to be taken into account, like data loading and the Oracle construction for the cost function, but still an interesting direction as well. Uh, and finally, another mathematical problem, the Monte Carlo integration, um, assuming that there is um, an epsilon uh, rate for the error, um, we see that um, uh, the amplitude estimation algorithm um, in quantum computing can reduce the complexity with quadratic speed up. Um, this is applicable to a couple of problems in finance, for example, option pricing and uh, risk analysis. Uh, we have actually demonstrated uh, at JP Morgan Chase the applicability of amplitude estimation to uh, option pricing. And also, uh, we created an algorithm for the state preparation that goes into uh, the uh, amplitude estimation algorithm, uh, which uh, is particularly attractive because it uses uh, a novel feature in quantum hardware called mid circuit measurement and reuse which basically allows for conditional logic and reusing qubits. Um, I would like at this point to pretty much take um, um, the presentation that um, Tyler uh, gave you before and kind of instantiate it into a specific use case, portfolio optimization. And I will show you how portfolio optimization can be executed on top of uh, brackets. So um, the first thing to consider is that we need to uh, define uh, the problem and uh, uh, generate the input data. So uh, the first cell here demonstrates how to load the portfolio optimization data. Um, we have a set of stocks uh, from randomly generated uh, data. So we're not using real stocks here because, of, uh, 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 because we are giving you like a demo. Um, and um, uh, given uh, the set of stocks, uh, we have a covariance matrix, which we call sigma, representing the relationship between the stocks and um, also the historical expected returns for each asset. From here, we formulate the problem as a QBO problem, where QBO stands for uh, quadratic binary optimization. So this QBO problem has two goals. One is to minimize the covariance which means to minimize the risk in uh, the correlation between the assets. And the other goal is to maximize the expected returns. I think that's pretty much the goal of uh, every portfolio optimization. And as I mentioned, the algorithm that we use here is QAOA, uh, the Quantum Approximation Optimization Algorithm. Um, this uh, algorithm, as I mentioned, has the advantage of creating shallow uh, circuits so it can be executed on uh, uh, hardware uh, available today, even though for small portfolios. And uh, uh, one interesting feature of this algorithm is that it's uh, variational. And uh, uh, this comes with uh, the fact that this algorithm is actually hybrid. Uh, hybrid means that um, it, uh, it is partially quantum and partially classical. So uh, it actually interleaves uh, classical computation with quantum computation. So it lends itself uh, uh, very nicely to uh, the hybrid support 
offered by Bracket. Um, the first thing that we need to do, though, in order to run portfolio optimization on top of uh, QAOA is to generate the inputs. So we, we need to actually take uh, the uh, portfolio optimization data, create a matrix, which in this case is called a nice Hamiltonian, which is like a Hermitian matrix, and pass it as an input to QAOA. Um, now, uh, QAOA will compute the minimum eigenvalue of this matrix, uh, which basically is the solution to the problem. So um, the minimum eigenvalue will correspond to the optimal uh, portfolio. Um, so um, um, basically, uh, another thing to consider at this point is that um, um, before running the algorithm on the quantum computer using QAOA, we can take advantage of the fact that quantum computers have not yet surpassed classical computers. So given that quantum computers are also like a precious resource, the first thing that we do at JP Morgan Chase, and I bet like in many other companies, is to run an algorithm uh, classically uh, to solve a problem classically in order to generate the reference values. As I said, we haven't surpassed uh, um, classical computing yet, so we might as well take advantage of this, run the problem classically, generate the reference values, and at the end verify that uh, our quantum algor algorithm is doing exactly what uh, we expect it to do. In the future, when um, uh, quantum computing reaches quantum advantage, we will not be able to afford running the same problem classically. So let's take advantage of this now. You can see uh, at the bottom, we generate the reference values classically. And uh, uh, this shows that um, the recommended outputs, uh, 1001, corresponds to uh, 1 meaning hold that particular uh, stock, 0 don't hold. So basically, uh, the algorithm is telling us that uh, stocks uh, um, 0 and 2, if we go by 0, 1, 2, and 3, so the first and the third uh, stocks uh, are recommended to be, to be held. So um, the, the next uh, uh, phases of uh, uh, this configuration, which is, by the way, very simple, because we take advantage of the fact that Bracket has the entire infrastructure already um, uh, constructed is that we simply have to specify the hyperparameters for this problem to be executed and how to um, upload the data. So we define the function that uploads the data to um, Amazon S3. Um, so uh, the, the rest of the execution goes by creating the hybrid job, specifying a starting point, uploading the data, uh, and specifying the, in the configuration where uh, the job should fetch the data from. And at this point, uh, QAOA starts executing. You can see that uh, from the output in the bottom, the job has started. And uh, um, as the execution goes along, um, we see that the uh, iterations of QAOA are taking place. Remember, QAOA is a hybrid algorithm, so it interleaves, as I said before, classical and quantum computation. Uh, at each point, it's pretty much performing an, an iteration, and you can see them here. And you can also see that at each step, at each iteration, the cost function um, uh, decreases, but not necessarily. So uh, it, it goes up and down at the beginning, but eventually, it decreases and converges. So this can be visualized um, here in this diagram. You can see at the bottom that uh, um, the same data that we saw printed in the output before shows that uh, uh, the cost function um, is um, going up and down a, a little bit at the beginning, but it eventually uh, goes down. So uh, we, uh, we know that we have converged and we can actually look at the results. And the results show us the same information that we computed previously using a classical computer. So we see that uh, stock zero and stock three are recommended, and this is corris this corresponds to one zero zero one, which is uh, also uh, the result with uh, uh, the highest probability uh, in the chart below. So um, it's uh, encouraging to see quantum computers being already capable of uh, uh, at least matching the results 
of classical computers uh, for now. Um, now, one more thing I wanted to say is um, in line with what uh, Tyler was also mentioning, uh, the benefits of uh, using a cloud-based system is that uh, you know it comes with uh, a lot of um, services like uh, security, monitoring, um, the cost management, everything. So here you see the cost management console uh, showing us uh, an integrated view of uh, our quantum experiment uh, cost. Um, so we don't have to really um, deviate from what uh, the cloud uh, system uh, gives us in general. Quantum becomes just uh, one of the many services offered with all the um, uh, associated um, services. And uh, um, another thing that we see is the resource monitor that allows us to see that uh, at the beginning, we were actually using 20.5% uh, of the CPU, and eventually when QAOA converges, uh, we go down to 0% usage. Again, this is uh, thanks to the fact that we are using uh, Bracket, uh, so we're using a cloud service that has a resource uh, monitor interface integrated. Um, at this point, I would like to uh, conclude with uh, some considerations. So almost like lessons learned uh, out of all the things that I have mentioned. So the first thing I would like to say is that the quantum stack is particularly sophisticated. Um, it, it doesn't include just the hardware, which is what we see has here at the bottom. So, um, for example, at JP Morgan Chase, we're doing uh, research at the level of applications and algorithms. So our applications are financial applications uh, that may use some optimization uh, routines. They, uh, we also have AI as an important use case. Um, you can see that the algorithmic layer is kind of split in two. Like uh, This indicates the fact that some of the algorithms are built by us. Some of the algorithms we take uh, uh, from brackets. Uh, for example, QAOA in this case didn't need to be uh, built uh, by us because we found it uh, already built in uh, in brackets. Uh, but the algorithm that I mentioned before, like NISC HHL, is something that we created. So um, uh, in general, however, uh, we see the uh, importance of using bracket as like a library of uh, algorithms, uh, the ability to uh, in many cases, uh, to write the uh, the algorithms in a hardware agnostic way, so it's not necessary, uh, at least for certain computers, to have to rewrite the code of your algorithms. Uh, if you have a layer that allows you to recompile those algorithms and generate circuits that uh, interface different uh, computers. And then, of course, you have the ability to access multiple computers and simulators. Uh, so this is actually an interesting um, feature overall. The fact that um, um, with a service like this, uh, no installation is required. Uh, all the users enjoy the same um, library environment, for example, the same Python environment, if Python is what you're using. And then uh, there is a, a low runtime overhead when quantum is integrated into a cloud system. Um, and the, um, I think the major benefit is also the fact that, um, that uh, different users can use a solution like this. Like researchers like us in JP Morgan Chase, in the future lab for applied research and engineering that is part of JPMC, uh, we enjoy the benefits of creating new algorithms and plugging them into this uh, stack. But similarly, users who don't want to necessarily learn quantum computing, say, for example, bankers who want to actually run financial applications, they can take advantage of the um, simplified user interface of, um, um, of brackets to execute uh, experiments that uh, include quantum computing without having to learn all the uh, intricate details of quantum computing. Um, hybrid algorithms are also um, something very useful now. So the support for hybrid computing turns out to be very useful. And um, um, we have seen that with QAOA for portfolio optimization before. Um, so 
uh, in conclusion, what are the actionable takeaways? So uh, to summarize, you remember what I mentioned before, this is the precious time in which enterprises can become quantum ready, um, which requires staying uh, on top of the growing quantum ecosystem and understand uh, uh, its effects. Uh, it's also necessary to identify the first wave applications, which means that um, um, quantum advantage is not going to come at the same time for all the applications uh, that uh, we have in a bank or same thing in a say, pharmaceutical company. There are uh, applications that uh, are going to be hit by quantum advantage before than others. So it makes sense to start investing in those applications now, uh, prioritizing those applications that uh, will benefit from quantum advantage before the others. And um, it's also important to understand where uh, your place is in the quantum uh, stack so that uh, you can start building uh, the, uh, the assets that will support your business use case. So I will pass it back to Richard and I would, want to ask, would like to ask Richard, what do you think about these actionable takeaways? Thanks, Marco. Uh, you know, it's really fascinating to see how you're approaching this topic. You know, you're laser focused on the opportunities that you've identified, and that's that's absolutely what I would expect. And I think it's great advice uh, for the listener. But I, you know, I think it's fair to say that your team is probably ahead of many other organisations, both in terms of resources you're committing uh, and the degree to which you understand the potential benefit. I'm guessing not everybody listening to this call right now is in that same enviable position. As I talk to customers, and I, you know, I hate to pigeonhole, but they tend to fall into one of four categories. You know, for example, I put you clearly in the category of quantum pioneer. You're actively committing resources. You truly believe this technology is going to be useful, even disruptive, and you're exploring actively how it can be used. You're focused on accelerating innovation across your organization. And you're really engaging the community, even sponsoring research. You've hired dedicated academics to your team. Fantastic. You know, the opposite end of the spectrum, though, are what we call the quantum curious. And I don't mean that in, in any sort of dis disparaging way. You know, you're, these folks are ultimately focused on learning, absolutely in learning mode. It's a complicated area. And they're trying to assess the state of the industry. You know, they're trying to understand the signal from the noise in the industry. They're trying to look beneath the headlines to see what's really going on. And they're trying to get started easily with necessarily making a heavy commitment. Uh, the other group, I think, is a really interesting group of what we call the, the quantum pragmatists. So these folks you know, are, are problem-centric. You know, they're focused on solving particular issues that they've identified in their organizations and pain points. They're pretty agnostic from a technology point of view. They don't really care whether they solve the problem with quantum computing or not. They're intrigued by the potential, they're interested. But at the end of the day, if they can solve the problem classically, here and now, then they're happy. And that's great. You know, this is one of the groups that we built the Quantum Solutions Lab for here at AWS. It's a professional services team um, that start with the problem and work backwards across various technologies such as high-performance compute, machine learning, quantum computing even, to solve that problem. And then finally, I think about the enablers in the community, solution providers that are building products and services to target specific use cases and they can take advantage of AWS resources and the bracket service to actually deliver those products and services. Thinking about consultants and trainers, educators. You know, I mentioned earlier that, that we likely have a real shortage of expertise in this industry. We have to go from thousands to ten, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of experts that can really deploy this technology. We need trainers, we need consultants to, to just make the learning curve less steep and ultimately to educate the quantum generation. Um, and then finally, researchers, of course. This is an industry, as I said earlier, you know, this is totally at the research stage. You know, this is not an engineering problem quite yet. This is still a research problem, scientific problem. Lots of researchers are very active in this field. Um, AWS is a huge supporter uh, of the research community. If you've got an interesting idea, you have a proposal around research for quantum computing, let us know. We have a specific program called AWS Credits for Research where we can help fund that program. So please, if you've got a great idea, just get in touch. So to wrap up, um, our advice, you know, start by identifying at least which of these four groups you think you're in. It really helps, I think, in terms of defining your goals and getting a sense of what success uh, might look like. As Marco mentioned, 
you know, really identify the resources that you want to commit to this project. You know, this is not something, it's a complicated area, this is not something that just sort of happens uh, just organically with an organization. Identify a team, give them some goals, have them stay focused. It's a rapidly evolving space. Someone needs to pay attention. As I say, dig beneath the headlines uh, and get started. Here's some hopefully useful resources. The bracket service, uh, as Tyler explained, makes it easy to get started and, and, and even allows you to explore some of the leading edge uh, areas of research, such as uh, hybrid algorithms with the high bracket hybrid jobs feature. If you want to collaborate, really work with our in-house experts or with our consulting partners, you want to dive down on a specific application that you've identified in your organization, then please reach out to the Quantum Solutions Lab. Uh, and then finally, you should absolutely track uh, what Marco is doing within JP Morgan Chase. Amazing team. Here's a link. You can follow his activity and, uh, and, and really stay engaged. So with that, I'd like to say a huge thank you to Tyler and Marco for their fascinating insights. Huge thank you for you to listening. Not an easy subject, I know. Uh, I really hope you found it useful. And thank you.